In Torchwood's first episode, Everything Changes, we were introduced to the mysterious organisation, to the backdrop of a sinister serial killer in the heart of Cardiff, eventually finding out that killer was Torchwood's own Susie Costello, who had initially been marketed as a full member of the cast, until she shot herself at the end. However, because there was a resurrection gauntlet in that episode capable of bringing the dead back to life, there was a very good path to bring back the character for a sequel story to explore the consequences of that opener. This sequel ended up being the mid-series episode They Keep Killing Susie, where a number of murders forced Torchwood to resurrect Susie to help with the investigation and find the killer who seems to want their attention. This was an episode I liked when I first saw it, but upon a second viewing, I noticed it's one of the Torchwood episodes that really suffers from being hugely mispotential, hurting itself in its confusion. So what makes They Keep Killing Susie fall short like this? Well, grab your resurrection gauntlet and let's see if we can get to the bottom of what went wrong with this extremely promising episode of series one. What about the Risen Mitten? What do you think it's catchy? They Keep Killing Susie opens very much like one of those American procedural crime dramas, which makes sense since Paul Tomlin wrote for that genre already. The Torchwood team rock up at a murder scene to get briefed by the police and I think it's a strong start to the episode. It's also very reminiscent of the beginning of Everything Changes. This shadowy organisation showing up to the distaste of the police already there. Detective Swanson clearly doesn't like Torchwood, just like how the forensics guy spoke badly about them and Everything Changes. I feel like it gives you a great window into how Torchwood is seen by other parts of the sector. How they're this try-hard, roguish group who act like they're better and more important than everyone else. Later on they're locked in the hub and have to swallow their pride, calling Swanson for help. They like to think they're above the regular police and the government, but now they need their help, which obviously brings great joy to the police, who finally have the chance to be above Torchwood. However, even though they get this kick out of it, the detective instantly straightens up and realises the seriousness of the situation, as soon as she finds out a Torchwood member is in danger. It shows that even though the police have this dislike of Torchwood, they're still on the same side in the bigger scheme, so they need to help each other when they can. It's a very three-dimensional portrayal of how these sectors view one another. I just think it makes a lot of sense for outsiders to have this complicated perspective of the team, so it's good world building to show their place within society and the industry. It's also shown with that great cliffhanger of seeing the word Torchwood smeared in blood on the wall of the murder scene. It feels so weighty and shocking, because we know how well Torchwood hides itself from the public, but here, their name is directly painted onto a murder scene, essentially exposing them and making them responsible. Greeks bearing gifts showed that there are copycat groups of scavengers who emulate Torchwood, but this is an entirely different level, because the murderer knows about Torchwood and wants their attention. It creates a sense of consequences, because Torchwood and their activities have indirectly led to this murder. If Torchwood didn't exist, this couple would still be alive, and when you think about it, most things up to this point have been problems indirectly caused by Torchwood. Susie wouldn't have become a serial killer, Gwen wouldn't have unleashed the sex gas, Yanto wouldn't have had a Cyberman girlfriend to accidentally unleash on the base. So many problems have been because of Torchwood themselves, so this is a nice way of showing that they have these hugely negative consequences on the world, even if they are working for the greater good and saving more lives than they're costing. I think the Torchwood team is similar to how the Doctor can be seen as a spectre of death and destruction, leaving so much pain and suffering in their wake, even if that's not the whole story. An outsider like Swanson can only see their negative influence because she has no idea about all the things Torchwood has done to save people. It's a good concept to explore, tying back to those consequences that form the backbone of the story. Consequences. I like that Torchwood are put at a disadvantage, putting them in unfamiliar territory, because they have no real leads as to who the killer could possibly be. They have too many enemies to count, which again is great for that world building and the consequences of their operations, especially because they find out the killer has Retcon in his blood. Retcon is a staple of Torchwood, having been used to wipe Gwen's memory after her encounter with them and everything changes. They deal with Retcon, so this is again indirectly their fault, because he wouldn't have it in his system otherwise, so this must be someone they've had contact with before, Yanto claiming they've given 2008 people Retcon which again, doesn't really narrow things down. The consequences of the opening episode are also shown because Gwen remembers the resurrection gauntlet and suggests they use it to question the victims. 
Obviously it's necessary for reintroducing Susie, but she brings it up with good reason. She knows they have no way of finding the link between the victims, they're at that severe disadvantage. But they own a glove that can resurrect the dead, so what better way to find the killer than to ask the victims themselves? It's a pragmatic idea by Gwen because she still has that memory of her first seeing them bringing a murder victim back to life. Jack and Owen protest her suggestion very well since they know exactly how dangerous the gauntlet is. They were part of the same team as Susie, her even being the second in command, so they know firsthand how much her betrayal hurt and how the gauntlet caused her to go down that path. Gwen doesn't have that relationship with Susie, she barely met her, so she doesn't truly understand what the gauntlet did to her or how bad her betrayal really was. It also gives you an idea of how severe and risky this gamble is, because the previous uses of the gauntlet caused so much bloodshed and deception, so they're opening themselves up for the possibility of that danger again. I like the scene of them using the resurrection gauntlet on the murder victims. It's structured so professionally, with Tosh recording it and Owen monitoring heart rates. It feels very organised and procedure based, which is always a good thing to do with a team like this, keeping it firmly linked to that procedural crime drama atmosphere. They might mess around and play basketball in their workplace, but they also take the job seriously and go by their loosely written rulebook when they have to. It's also interesting that Jack isn't able to use the gauntlet. I think the obvious implication is that he himself is in that limbo between life and death, so the gauntlet can't work with him controlling it. And before you say it, the one he uses in series 2 is the other one, so we'll get to how that one is different when I get there. It also turns out that Owen, Yanto and Hosh weren't able to use the gauntlet when they first started testing it. It only worked for Susie, but then Gwen tries it and it works because she still has the empathy and human nature required. She's the newest member, so she hasn't been fully blunted and desensitised by this job, so it makes sense that it would work for her since it plays upon those concepts in day one, of her being the human heart of the team. I think the drip feed of information within the first 10 minutes is great. It slowly builds up more and more of the story. First we get that establishment of someone wanting Torture's attention, then there's the reveal of the killer having Retcon in his system, then they use the glove and Mark tells them about the killer, dropping the bomb that the killer was talking to a woman called Susie. It all gets pieced together and builds up so well, the team realising that Susie is that link to Torchwood after all, because they didn't know her well enough, they had no idea what she was up to when she wasn't at work. Even though she was Jack's second in command, neither he nor Torchwood were really friends or that close to her, so I think it's a good way to show how none of the Torchwood members know each other as well as they think. They didn't know about Yanto hiding Lisa away, Tosh didn't know what Owen really thought about her, and only Gwen knows that Jack can't die. It's good for seeding the team's division and mutiny in End of Days, how there isn't a complete level of trust between them all, they're not as close as they like to think they are, and it causes a lot of issues because they all lack that human touch needed to survive in a job like this. You've been hidden down here too long, spending so much time with the alien stuff, you've lost what it means to be human. Because they don't know much about Susie, they go to a lockup where all her belongings are being kept, trying to get a better sense of who she was. When a torture member dies, all their belongings are kept in lockups like this. It's quite chilling in a way, everything about a person being boxed up and locked away, that being the last record of her existence. Because that's all we are in the end. Photos, records, memories. I also think that in a way this episode is a character exploration of a dead character. We had episodes exploring each of the team members, but Susie had died in that first episode, so she didn't have any exploration. However, this episode gives Susie extensive exploration in the same way as those other episodes had explored the characters. She wasn't really in need of one, but I think it's a nice touch that she does. It humanises her because we never got that glimpse at who she was, only who she'd become as a result of the gauntlet. There's a really sombre mood as they resurrect Susie, Jack having to face the consequences of Torchwood by bringing her dead body out of the morgue, Gwen finding out that every Torchwood member gets frozen and kept at the hub forever, before Tosh goes back to her station because she can't bear to look Susie in the eye. It's a good prelude to her resurrection, setting up a good dramatic atmosphere and showing you just how weighty this decision is. This is them bringing someone back to life, someone they knew. It's not a stranger, but it's not some poor murder victim. This is someone they knew and worked with, who betrayed them and tried to kill Gwen and Jack. I think it adds a lot of seriousness and drama to the moment because of these realities. Then the situation is amped up because the glove doesn't work, they have to resort to using the knife Susie killed all her victims with. It shows just how far they're having to resort, pulling both these things out of their vaults because they have no other choice. They need Susie for this investigation, so they have to resort to becoming like her, killing her with the knife just to be able to bring her back. It's a smart way of tying the knife to the glove, because it's made out of the same metal, explaining why Susie was so good with it, because she 
used the knife alongside the glove whenever she killed people. They're no better than her now. These are the lengths they have to go to, which I just think is a really good touch. Then Susie comes back and they aren't actually able to get any information from her in time. They think they've failed. After all of that, all that drama and risk, they ended up right back at square one. But then it turns out that she's still breathing, even without the glove or the knife. She's still alive. It's a huge shock because it completely breaks every rule of the glove that had been established. Every single use of the glove had shown that it's only supposed to work for a short time. But for some reason, Susie just stays alive, completely throwing the team for a loop. I think there's some kind of irony to Susie being the one to stay alive permanently because of the glove. The whole time she was using it, she was working towards the possibility of it curing death. And now here she is, the one that was cured. I wouldn't say it justifies her actions and everything changes because she still went and murdered three innocent people, but I just think it's interesting that she's the one to survive past the Gauntlet's window of resurrection. The later developments of the story kind of ruin this concept, but I'll get to that when I get to it. Now that Susie is still alive and can't die, the story is able to really explore some existential themes and concepts in some great ways. One of the ways this episode explores these concepts is the really tense scene of the interrogation. Susie just wanting to be dead but being confronted by these people she used to work with, including Owen and Tosh who she knows are hiding from her. I mean, it's very justifiable to not want to face someone who should be dead. It's like looking at a ghost. This walking reminder of death and someone who died because of the emotional effects of the very organisation they work for. I like her reasoning that she fed Max to recon because she just wanted someone to listen to her. The placement of the episode is a great benefit for this because in Countryside, Gwen felt isolated and alone for not being able to talk to anyone about Torchwood. Then in Greeks Bearing Gifts, Tosh felt the same isolation, becoming attached to Mary as a result of her loneliness and inability ability to share her life with someone outside of Torchwood. So because there are these two very recent examples of this effect on the personal lives of members, you can understand and even sympathise with Susie for needing this outlet and release, even if she ended up overdosing Max and causing him to develop psychosis as a result. I just think it makes this character motivation relatable and understandable, because this is such a difficult job to do. It's something you have to hide like a dirty secret. All the things you see and all the things you do are tucked away and you have to pretend to be living a normal life, even though every day you're putting your life on the line and facing all kinds of monsters and aliens. To have to hide all of that and live such a deceitful life would be really traumatic and hard to live with because you would be constantly feeling guilt for the people you're lying to and feeling trapped because there's no way of reaching out. That's what drives characters characters like Susie, Gwen and Tosh to desperately reach for any kind of lifeline, anyone they can share their pain with and not have to hide from. And who better to talk to than some random guy you know at a tiny little religious support group with no presence anywhere? You slip him the retcon and there's seemingly no consequence. From a surface perspective, it's a lot more moral and innocent than what Gwen is doing, since Gwen is cheating on her boyfriend. So it's good for drawing parallels between Susie and Gwen. There you go, replace me completely. Susie and Gwen are the two main characters of the episode. There's a good scene between them as Susie asks to see her dying father. Since Gwen is the most compassionate and human member of the team, she's the one most likely to feel sympathy for Susie and give her these kinds of opportunities, because she has a lot of empathy. They actually bond over how good and bad the Torchwood job is. It's a nice moment for Gwen since she's able to talk about Torchwood like it's any other job. It makes it seem no different to running into an old co-worker who used to sort parcels or stack shelves with you. It's not every day you get to meet a former Torchwood operative, because it's not exactly a job you retire from. You're there for life. It's also interesting that Susie is face to face with her replacement, reflecting on how Gwen is better and more liked than she was, seeing this younger, more capable person sitting where she used to. You can understand why Susie would be hurt by this. As I said, it's not every day you get to meet a former Tortured operative, so it's just as rare to come face to face with your replacement, who even sleeps with the same co-worker you did. It shows how time goes on after you die. The world doesn't stop, it keeps turning and people go about their lives. You get replaced by friends, lovers, employers, and it all just keeps turning because you're not even a blip in the radar of the universe. It's just an interesting concept to explore, being confronted by the reality of the world moving on without you and how that would affect you. Once they have Max in custody, Susie's job is basically done, but they can't do anything about it because she can't die again. They're just kind of stuck with her, creating this huge moral dilemma. Do they lock her up and let her waste away until she hopefully dies for good? Do they let her back into the team despite everything she did? I think it's a really good moral quandary to put our protagonists in, having to constantly live with this consequence of their actions. Consequences. On the topic of their actions and consequences, I've spoken before about the seeds of dissent within the team culminating in End of Days, but they keep killing Susie continues to set that plot point up. 
Gwen bursts into Jack's office and confronts him for putting Susie in charge of the glove when she had a dying father. Out of all the members of the team, she was the one least suited to be a neutral party operating the glove, because it was only natural for her to become obsessed with his power and the potential to save her dad from death. It makes Susie an even more sympathetic character because she never wanted to do what she did with the glove. In my Everything Changes review, I spoke about how Susie wasn't a cackling, black and white, evil character because she was just misguided. This reinforces that idea because Jack should have handled things better and thought about the personal impact, being aware of her dying father. He's not infallible and he makes big mistakes like this. Much like the Doctor, sometimes there's this detachment from understanding people on a human level, and it leads to situations like this, not doing enough for his team, even though he already does so much for them. It then turns out that the glove takes energy from the user, Gwen's life force becoming tethered to Susie, so this whole time it's been slowly starting to drain her to strengthen Susie more. As Jack says, there's always a price. There's a reason we don't have the power to live forever. There's a reason it's seemingly this holy grail because there's always a cost, and someone always has to pay in some sort of way. Jack knows it firsthand, since even though he can live forever and always comes back from the dead, his price is watching the people he knows and loves die, like we saw with Estelle in Small Worlds. The price of using the glove is killing the wearer, so now they have this dramatic race against time to kill Susie and save Gwen's life. This establishment of Gwen slowly dying causes the stakes of the episode to skyrocket, because she leaves with Susie, the rest of the team becoming trapped in the hub with no way out. This is great for the story, injecting a lot of tension and creating a race against time, but it also leads to the episode shooting itself in the foot with a rocket launcher. As the torture team are trapped in the hub, they realise that Susie planned this entire situation from before she even died, having purposefully implemented the psychosis into Max, including a verbal trigger to lock down the hub. I really honestly detest this twist. It completely derails the characterization of Susie. It is such a far-fetched and ridiculous plan because it relies on so many variables. I can't believe that the episode looks you dead in the eye and tells you that Susie knew she'd be caught so befriended a random guy, fed him retcon over the course of two years to induce a psychosis, then makes him go on a murder spree three months since she last saw him, causing Torchwood to get involved and work out the link back to her to bring her back to life, where she can hijack her replacement's life force and convince her to smuggle her out of the hub, locking it down by having Max recite a specific poem before she can get away. I mean, seriously, how does that plan make any realistic sense? It makes her the exact kind of master villain I praised Everything Changes for not making her. Her plan is way too specific to feel real, and it just seems like a very bad decision to take this route. I would have preferred the story if it was just Susie grappling with the potential lifeline of regaining her own life, at the expense of the person who completely replaced her, exploring the moral dilemma of this and the human instinct of survival. I just think that's the better story to tell in my opinion. The episode even teases this narrative, getting very existential as Gwen and Susie are driving to the hospital. Gwen has been given this opportunity to talk to someone who has died, so I don't think it's a surprise that she immediately asks Susie what happens when you die. It is such a human thing to ask. As a species, we're always so wrapped up in our existence, terrified of what it's like to not exist. We're so scared of oblivion and a lack of existence that we create these religions and belief systems to keep us sane and give us a sense of comfort. We can't even comprehend death, so that's why people like Gwen believe that even if there's no heaven, there has to be some kind of afterlife because what's life for otherwise? If death is just nothingness, what's the point of life? That's what this scene is about. It tells us that life is what we make of it. There's no point preparing yourself for an afterlife that doesn't exist. You have to live for the little things and appreciate your life. Susie gives a fantastic speech about why aliens are drawn to Earth, because it's their instinct to see life, to connect with others because the alternative is silence and isolation. It's just like how these torture members find themselves so desperate for human contact. Like the aliens, it's the torture members instincts to want to reach out and find comfort because they're all alone otherwise. I also love Susie's sinister warning about there being something in the darkness. When you die, you're not alone in the dark. There's something lurking out there, even in that absence of existence. It's chilling to think about because there's no afterlife, just something sinister in the darkness with you, moving closer. It's a good setup for the return of the Gauntlet in series 2, but even on its own, it's a very chilling moment that justifies our fear of death suggesting that's why we're terrified of dying, because we know there's something waiting for us in the darkness. There's something moving in the dark, and it's coming, Jack Harkness. Gwen and Susie then see her dying father, and Susie reveals that she wanted him to die all along because of something unspecified he did to her in his past. 
I like that her killing him holds extra weight because she knows what she's sending him to, having been trapped in that darkness herself. But again, I still don't like that she becomes so typically evil. The episode tries to make you feel some sympathy by having her explain her desperation to survive, but she just becomes so black and white evil, no longer having that nuance the episode initially set up. Her not being morally grey anymore. I like the idea of her being so desperate to survive, so scared of the darkness that she'd do anything, but it's the fact that she had this planned all along that makes her too evil for this sympathy to work. Her motivations become so majorly ruined by the step backwards in her characterisation. It just leaves a really bad taste in my mouth and it detracts from the climax in the episode as a whole. Earlier she had talked about Jack's immortality, comparing it to her own resurrection. She's justifiably aggrieved that he's allowed to make judgments on whether she should live or die when he himself can't die, so why should she pay for her immortality? It sets up the idea that Jack has a dilemma of whether to kill her, but they make her too evil for this idea to work or have any dramatic tension, because she's no longer a sympathetic character. When Jack catches up, he kills Susie as promised, just to realise they have to destroy the gauntlet because she can't die otherwise. It's a good twist for the ending, but I feel like all tension and emotion is hampered by her suddenly being a cackling, evil villain. She lays there taunting Jack and it just feels like something was taken away by this climax by not keeping her morally ambiguous. If this hadn't been some grand master plan, if she had just wanted to cling to life after seeing the darkness, it would make the moment a lot more powerful, but they make her an out and out antagonist. If they had gone that more simplistic, introspective route, it would have given Jack a tough dilemma. Sentence this woman to death and send her back into the darkness? Or allow her to live and allow the innocent Gwen to die? Everything changes and the first half of this episode had built up a certain level of sympathy for Susie, so her final death would have been very emotional and bittersweet if it wasn't for that sudden heel turn out of nowhere. The episode even acts as though this is the case. The camera slowly zooming out as Jack stands on the pier over Susie's corpse, an emotional song playing as if this was some heartbreaking moment, but it isn't. This wasn't some tough moral decision. Susie had become just another monster for Torchwood to kill. It really damages the episode in my opinion because it strips any weight away from the ending and retroactively hurts all the development earlier in the story. Captain, my captain. However, I do like the final scene of They Keep Killing Susie, as Jack reflects on the number of bodies in the morgue, how they'll run out of space eventually. As I said in my Everything Changes review, he's been part of Torchwood for so long, almost since the Institute's very beginning, so he has probably had to put all of these bodies into the morgue in the first place, outliving everyone he has ever worked with as part of this organisation. There are so many deaths, so many bodies that have piled up because of Torchwood. It's not just the outer world that suffers from them, it's within the Institute too, showing how severe these consequences can be. It's a high price to pay to work for them, and that's reflected by Jack telling Yanto to put the cause of death as simply Torchwood. It's an actual weighty moment after the failed dramatic moment the scene before. It continues to drive home the brutality of the job, how you're almost signing up to die. That's just what the job is like. Then there's also a very nice tease as Yanto mentions that gloves come in pairs. It sends a genuine chill down my spine, even without the knowledge of the sequel in series 2. It's a great revelation because the concept was staring us right in the face the whole time. Why would there only be one resurrection gauntlet? Why would the creators only make one? Even if there wasn't a story with the second glove, it's such a good ending sting, because it feels inevitable that the issue of another glove would arise. It's like shoes, you would never just make one. Oh, and speaking of shoes, the next episode is titled Random Shoes. What a happy coincidence that is. I remember when I first saw They Keep Killing Susie a couple of years ago, I really loved it. I thought it was so great, but revisiting it, it wasn't as good as I remembered. There were bits I love even more now, but there are other things I found that really went down in my evaluation. I just can't get past the sudden pivot in the characterisation of Susie. If it wasn't for that, this would easily be an A rank, but that change in character means I feel like I have to give it a C rank on the Tortured Series 1 tier list. And that's a huge shame, because so much of the episode is absolutely incredible. I love how it explores the realities of death and what it would really be like if you get resurrected after dying, really diving into those existential concepts. The episode is paced and directed well, with a great progression of the narrative throughout and really high personal stakes, but it just falls short in that characterisation of Susie. Indira of Armour does another fantastic job as the character, but I just don't like the direction they took her, because they stripped away all the moral ambiguity and sympathy from the character. It's a good episode as a sort of mid-series finale, revisiting the consequences and concepts from the series 1 opener, so it helps to prop the series up in the middle by continuing the themes of the series, showcasing these personal 
struggles all the members are going through, and how the tortured lifestyle affects people. Susie's absolute whiplash into becoming a conniving villain wouldn't be so bad if she wasn't the main focus of the episode. I think I'd go so far as to say the episode is an A rank right up until the team find out she's planned it all along. The moment that happens, the episode becomes an instant C rank, because it just becomes typical schlock without nuance. It throws away all that goodwill and turns the episode into a huge missed opportunity, which really pains me to say. I want to love this episode, but for a story all about Susie, they kind of mess up the one thing they needed to do. So they pretty much wasted her return, especially because her planned other return in series 2 fell through because Indira Varma was pregnant. Well, they can always resurrect her again, right? Oh wait, they did that in a book and made sure she stayed dead. Great job guys, great job. And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my gold level patrons, Daniel Shilato, John, Mark Hippolgai-Taylor and Stephanie Neville-Miller. Thank you a lot for your support.